uh, doctor, Ph.D., uh, pages 12, 13, 14. We'll probably read some of that because he has some interesting stuff on Abraham that I think you ought to listen to because as we uh, formulate uh, a hypothesis and uh, we create this picture in your mind, we want to make sure that we can substantiate it. And it goes from a educated guess to fact. Oh, man. And then when they say, you're heretics, say, no, 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 you just ain't got a Bible. Because this says this, this says this. And if this says this, this says this, it must mean this, right? Okay, just so we got that understood. I thought we would. So what did we teach last week then? If we got, we got, the, we got the circle, remember the spiritual circumcision, or the uh, fleshly circumcision taking care of Abraham, then I think we went into a hell thing, didn't we? Like a Luke 16. And we went and we showed you about the soul. And we, we come to the conclusion that the soul is shaped just like your body. So now we got a physical body that we're looking at, and inside that physical body is a soul that looks just like that. And we also demonstrated that it had emotions. It's seen, it heard, it, it, it was thirsty. Man. And it even for some, some stretch of the imagination, because you get all these things, it's, it's horror week, right? I never, you can't, I mean, everything on television, everything's about horror now. I mean, you know, horror this and horror that. And I ain't talking about red light this week, I'm talking about them spooky things, okay? Amen. It's Wednesday night, right? We're all mature. Anyway, um, and, and you, you always get this idea that since they're down there in hell, that they don't have this, you know, this kind of love or emotion for, for something. You know what I mean? But yet my Bible's telling me that that rich man didn't want his people coming there. Didn't want them to be in that kind of situation, that flame. And we showed you that it wasn't just uh, separation from God. But it was actual torment. And when you look at all the verses in the King James Bible that talk about hell, flame, gnashing of teeth, and you go to all these other perversions, you're going to find out they eliminate a lot of that. Most of them just take it out completely. Because to God would never do that, that kind of thing. No, it's just separation. It just means separation from God. You know, like, okay, I'll never see you again. Boo-hoo, right? That's where they're going to scare somebody, huh? Now, the actual fact of them being separated from God, that is, that is a torment in itself. But God knows the way we operate and how we think in the flesh. We don't even think we're going to die for crying out loud. Do you know that? If you, if you talk to 95% of the people out there, not saying, yeah, I know I'm going to die. I'm, you know. Yeah, right. Stop being so negative. You know, if you're breathing air, you're going to die. Everybody's going to die, right? But you don't think about it all the time. So if a guy gets up there and he says, and, and if, if you don't get saved, you'll be separated from God. From God, you'll be separated. You know, right? And they're saying, wow. And I know it takes the Holy Spirit to convict, but it takes the Word of God, right? They'll be gnashing of teeth! Torment! God says, I got your attention. And it, yeah, different. Difference between preaching and teaching. And uh, so I guess preaching like that for all those years sort of kept America straight. <laughs> you know, it just shocked you into reality. Whoa, okay. Whew. You know, you hear them old timers saying when somebody spoke on hell, they could smell the brimstone. They could hear things crackling. And they weren't imagining I mean, they were imagining them, but I mean, I mean, it was actually, they could actually do that. The Holy Spirit would get in there. Because the Holy Spirit gets into the Word of God. And you mess with the sword, you're going to end up with a butter knife. Does no kind of cutting. And today, before we're done, we're going to find out that you got a Word of God, right? A spiritual Word of God that will cut something. It will cut you loose. Right? Let them loose. Amen. Well, we'll get with Abraham here. Anyway, the soul. Remember the soul? We covered that last week. Amen. So along comes Abraham, and about the time that he shows up, the Lord calls him out one night and says, Abraham, I'm, I'm quoting this booklet, okay? Look up in the air. Abraham looks up in the air, and the Lord says, what do you see up there? Abraham says, I see a bunch of stars. The Lord said, hmm, I'm going to give you as many children as there are stars. Abraham said, I believe it. The Lord said, you do? 
Abraham said, yes, I do. The Lord said, don't you want some kind of like rain check to secure it or something? Abraham answered, no, if you said it, I believe it. The Lord said, now look here, old man. You're about 100 years old. You know that, don't you? Abraham said, hmm, if you say so, I am. Lord says, are you sane? Abraham replies, well, Lord, if you say it, I believe it. So the Lord said, hmm, I'll tell you what. If you're that wild and will go that far and put your faith in me that much, I'm just going to give you my righteousness. Then God gave Abraham his righteousness. One day the Lord took me out to a hill and told me to look up. He said, what do you see? I said, it looks to me like a dead Jew. He said, well, what's he doing? I said, I don't know. Looks like he's dying. Yeah, looks like he's dying to me. The Lord said, all right, you trust that. And I'll get you to heaven. I answered, okay, I believe it. The Lord asked, do you believe that a dead Jew can get you to heaven? I said, if you said it, I believe it. The Lord said, well, I'll tell you what. If you're going that far out in left field to put your faith in me, I'm just going to give you my righteousness. I got it. I got it. Do you have your own righteousness? I'll tell you what. If you have yours, you can keep it. I have someone else's. That's why I had to read this. It's good. He's got some good stuff in there. He's an old man. I think he's... <sighs> no, Brother Barefoot's a little older than him. He'll be 91 November 10th, I think. Doc. Amen. So he told Abraham, I'm going to give you my righteousness. Abraham believed in God and it counted it to him for righteousness, according to Genesis 15, 6. The Lord told Abraham over in Genesis 17, Now get a knife, Abra uh, get a knife. Abraham said, What for? The Lord said, You're going to cut yourself where it hurts the most. Abraham said, Why do I have to cut myself? The Lord said, Well, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And I have to cut you in the right place because your problem is your seed. Abraham said, what's wrong with my seed? Lord said, your seed is no good. So your seed is no good. See, the trouble is your seed. Do you know what Simon Peter said? Do you remember Simon Peter in the New Testament? You know what he said? Being born again, not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Why? For all flesh is his grass. First Peter one twenty three. Do you know why I die? My, my daddy died. Do you know why my daddy died? His daddy died. Do you know why they died? Their daddies died. Do you know what is wrong with us? There's something wrong with our seed. Can't you get that? Suppose I had a room full of doctors and lawyers. Do you think I could care less? About you uh, going to drop dead? You're going to kick the bucket, Doc says. They're going to put you to bed with a shovel. Just like me. I don't care what a bunch of doctors, lawyers, scientists think. Go to bed, sonny. Pack them down the dirt. I mean, all flesh is as grass. There is something wrong with the seed. I just got so enamored with this guy, man. I like him. The Lord says, once again, cut yourself. So he cuts himself. Why does he do that? Well, because he's masochistic. He's just one of those cutters, cuts his bodies. No, no, no. That's what the modern person would think when they read this. That's why every time somebody thinks about... When, you can tell how corrupt our whole society is. I'm serious. All of us. As soon as it says that he saw the woman, she was pretty, you know, they were both naked. In the, as soon as the word naked's mentioned, we're so jacked up as a... Uh, Real War II people may still have a little bit of sense. But after that, the Korean and all that stuff, I mean, as soon as you say certain keywords, we are messed up people. I don't know how to reverse that. <laughs> we're just... It, it's just like, it's just like it, it, our kids, once they get on, I mean, they're like 34 by the time they're 16. Because of the information highway. They don't even have to be corrupt. They can just get in the information highway. They can be just everything up here. Nothing experienced. Nothing practical. And that's why we've got a bunch of know-it-alls going all over the place. 
So anyway, this is way back in Abraham's time. And Abraham's still trying to figure out a little bit. I mean, the Lord's told him that, but you got to imagine. I mean, he told him to just go. Abraham didn't ask where. He said, take your family, right? He said, take Sarah, go. Showed her submission to him. Imagine what she was thinking. Whew, are you nuts? Go where? I don't know. Who told you, God? Um, okay. What you've been smoking? You was out with them camels too long. You know, I mean, what you got? I mean, you know, she, she not even, it, it doesn't even say she questioned anything. Just got him and went with him. It was because of that kind of action of Abraham that got him where he's at now. You see in our story, he believed God. And it doesn't matter how you figure things out, it's just whether you believe God. <clears throat> so, back in the Old Testament, the Lord couldn't give a man a new birth. I hope you all know that. Some of the brethren don't. Listen, if Abraham was born again, he was spiritually circumcised. The reason he had a knife to do the cutting was because he wasn't spiritually <laughs> circumcised. He was not born again. Nobody in the Old Testament was born again. you got to get a hold of this, right? Now go to Colossians chapter 2. Because we're so sick of the Pentecostals and the holiness people all the time trying to take us to the left side of the cross in the Old Testament, trying to put us under all that stuff, right? And then we got the fundamentalists doing it. Not all of them, not all of them, thank God. It depends what school you graduated from, I guess. I, I don't know, man. It, you know, you look at it and say, are you, are you for real? Abraham was born again, huh? Wow. Yeah, man, you got a credit card, man. Oh, oh, okay. So on the credit card, he was born again. Holy Spirit was inside him, right? Sealed, right? Oh, uh, uh, and then they get all tongue twisted. Well, why do you even believe that stuff? Anyway, Colossians, well, we'll, we'll get to the meat of all this probably in a little bit. Uh, but you need to understand uh, you're in the New Testament, right? So if you're in the New Testament, you're no longer under the law. You're on the other side of Calvary. Calvary, right? You're on the side of Calvary where Christ has already died. Already died. He was buried and has risen. Now, I want you to look at the difference over there. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verses 11 and 13. See what happened when you were saved. When you were saved, okay? This is what it says. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without what? Hands, comma, in putting off, putting off, you got it, putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of who? Christ. Now look at verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, when you read that thing over and over again, you start to connect some things, right? The circumcision made without hands, amen? That, like, boom, okay. Why? Because you just already know it's the movement of the flesh. That's what you remember in the Old Testament. That's what the whole word's about. And here, all of a sudden, that word shows up. I like it. And it shows up, but this time it's without hands. Therefore, it couldn't have been the circumcision of Abraham. He had a real live knife. He hurt. He smarted. This is without hands. It's good. I'm telling you. Amen. And it says in putting off. Now what? What, 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 what are you going to put off? Foreskin of a man? Is that what it's talking about here? Ah, I don't see that anywhere. How about some other part of the body? Maybe put off an arm or a leg or... No, it says putting off... Look at the words. This is King James Bible stuff. This is why a lot of times we disagree with other people because we just take the Word of God as literal. Putting off the body. See that? The body. B-O-D-Y of the sins of the flesh. How? 
by the circumcision of Christ. Through what? Through what? The faith of what? Of what? The operations. You read down? Did you get it? Just say operation, right? I've been in the hospital, had a whole lot of operations. I mean, I don't know what that means. So there's nothing like a King James Bible to clear you up, amen? I mean, you think about that. Spiritual cutting. Hmm. Unbelievable. See, in God's mind, if we could get there a little bit, while Abraham was doing the physical cutting, God already knew what that was representing. When it happened, past tense, I can look back and see that that's exactly what that meant. Right? It was a shadow of things to come. Now it came. That means it was manifested to us. This truth that we have in the New Testament is manifested. It lightens up that whole Old Testament. Well, I pity people with just that Old Testament. Man, don't want to accept the New Testament? Wow. All them hidden things in the Old, everything revealed in the New. That's cool stuff, man. I like it. So, so what now, Bob? Okay. We finish there. Cutting. Seed, seed, seed. Hmm. Yeah, that's good too. So, you cut yourself there because someday I'm going to perform a spiritual cutting and I can't perform it yet. Why can't I perform it yet? The seed is no good. So, you have to get the right seed. Do you know what he said to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3? He said what? The seed. Right? Remember the seed? The seed? It's all about the seed. It says, the seed of the woman will bruise your head. And that's what he said to the devil. <clears throat> All right, along comes Jesus Christ. He dies on the cross for your sins. He is buried. He comes up the third day from the dead. He died on the cross for your sins. Remember that. He's buried. He lies in the tomb three days and three nights. He comes back from the dead. Here comes eternal life. Eternal life comes along, goes through Calvary, through the tomb, and through the resurrection. And something happens, and nobody knows exactly what happens. But somehow, when he hung on that cross and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was a break in eternity. Don't know how that happens. I can't figure it out. And we know that his outside vessel, that sin was put on him. He took upon the sins of the world. We know that God is God. We know that the spirit that was in him raised him up, right, quickened him. But something happened when he was on that cross. And that's when he was down in hell. I believe he, he went from one eternity and went to the other. Because he suffered all things for us. And I was a brother and I read their books and everything about how Jesus didn't go to hell. But you're, you're, you're calling my Bible a liar. Something had to happen. If you can picture that. I mean, the same way you can picture he's eternal. That's as deep as that can go. You can crack your brain, have your brains come out your ears. Think about him dying for you, suffered all things. Remember, yet he saw no corruption, but he went to hell. And I don't know how that works. I, I don't even want to think about it. I really get a headache over that one. But if he went down and dropped everything off, right, and suffered the whole penalty, just imagine the devil on people down there. Remember, you know, like that song? Devil, devil, you know, check him three days, he's moving, you know. That Christian song. Hey, my kids sang it, maybe somebody sang it. You know what I'm talking about, or are you looking crazy at me? The Blunkalls sang it. The devil, like, was over there, and he's talking to death, and death, you know. You still got him? He says, Yeah, no problem. And then after three days, remember, after three days, the devil runs out. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> now, I could just picture that. Doing an attorney thing, got him down there, right? All that sins, right? Whatever happened. And then all of a sudden, he just walked right out. And what does he do when he walks out? Takes the keys, man. Can you imagine that? Hell and death. So he said, he said to the devil, come here. Come here, boy. Went over to death says, and walked right out. That's why we can't go there. They can't lock us up. 
can never drown because your head's always above water. I mean, it's just something else. I like this stuff. <clears throat> What's learning to make thee mad? Now nah, it makes you excited, too. This is this King James Bible can be a real good drug for you. It really can. So this eternity thing is just an amazing thing in how that happens anyway. <clears throat> now, when he came off the cross, do you know what he said? What did he say when he came off the cross? It is finished. Remember that? I guess I shouldn't word it like that. It'd be one of them trick story problems things. I thought, he, I thought when he took him off the cross, he was dead. You know. So I better watch what I say now. I'm getting all confused. Anyway, he said the last thing he said was, it is finished. And uh, so he goes down to the grave. Up he comes from the grave, right? What does he say? I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, the beginning and the ending. What happened? He rose again. So where did he go? He went right up where he came from. Where did he come from? Well, he came from eternal life. Where does he go? He goes to eternal life. Why? Because he's the beginning and the ending. That is eternal life. How long is God going to live? Eternal. Who started? Who ended? God. <laughs> you mean there's a start and an end? No, it's just eternal. It's just God. You have to take pills after you do this sometimes. You have to take a lot of aspirins, headache. You know, don't listen to spiritual music when you're reading this stuff. It's terrible. I'm telling you. But eternal life, eternal life. Hmm. The beginning and the ending. That is life that was before the foundation of the world. One time the Lord Jesus uh, Christ said in his high priestly prayer over there, his high priestly prayer is in what book and chapter, Dale? John 17. I know. I know you know that. He says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So eternal life goes through Calvary. Now, you step up to the New Testament side of Calvary, and you look at a man to see how he makes it, or how he makes out. The chosen seed of Israel's race has shown up. The perfect sacrifice has been made. And listen, Beware of anybody that tries, and this is good here, anybody that tries to get you back over on the other side of Calvary. Walden Jones, which was a missionary to uh, Mexico, we, we, his son's over there now, taking over, and I mean, it, it, they're good missionaries over there. I wish we could do it. But he was over in Mexico, and, and he says uh, most of the people who went to Christ, uh, they continue to try to go on the other side of the cross. You see, because on the other side of the cross, you can find priests wearing those garments, but you see, on this side of the cross, you don't find any of that in the Bible. So because of their culture, they're all the time trying to drag them people back to the Catholic Church, even after they're saved. And see, since it's ingrained in them, it's hard to break them from it. And because of that, you get, you get the, uh, doubts of your salvation. All sorts of weird things start happening to you. Because you don't have that security that you're supposed to have. Yet you're saved. And you got saved on the other side of the cross because it was the resurrection. Right? It's the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, in anything, in doctrine or anything, when you start to get doubts or anything, check yourself out, right? Where are you at? Where are you reading? What's going on? What are you thinking? Right? What are you thinking at that time? And it's usually one of these. Well, what if? You know? You get doubts when you start saying, well, what if? That's when you're supposed to do what? Get in the Word of God and say, it ain't about what if, it's what's now. And you don't go before the cross to be digging up that stuff. You go after the resurrection. That's why I always tell people, stay in the Pauline epistles, man. Get grounded really good first. The book of John is great, too. Gospel of John. It's shown the deity of Jesus Christ solidly. Maybe First, Second Thessalonians is good, too, for a young Christian. But uh, you need to get that down and, and understand that because that's what's happening uh, with a lot of people. With all these different types of... Uh, Christian um, things that are going on. Once they get you over on the other side, then you're, you're in bondage to them. You really are. And you don't need to be. Why? Because what did he say? What did he say? He said it's finished. So if he said it's finished, what is it? I mean, how can you add to that? He's on the cross, right? And he says it's finished. 
So every time you add anything to it, then you're contradicting the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's heavy stuff. They don't want to think about that. That'll give them a headache. That's why we need to give them a headache rather than give us a headache. Yeah. It's just like when they say, well, you ain't got that Bible. All the Bibles are messed up. I says, then, then what you believe is you're not born again. They will argue with you. Then you take them to First Peter. Remember that one right there? Being born again, not a couple of Remember that one? Yeah, I thought you did. I was speaking in tongues. So if you don't have one, how can you be born again? I like messing with them. Really, it's 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 better. They mess with me too long, so I just mess. I just tell them I'm not born again, and they'll get all frustrated and leave. You know, that's what you need to do, though. So let's see the best example. I'm trying to think of an example. So one day you took the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, right? Well, what happened to you? <laughs> I mean, what, what happened to you? Well, in Hebrews 4, remember that? The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is Now, I'm just going to give you a little idea. You can paint a picture if you want in your head. The Holy Spirit stepped inside of you, and He cut your soul loose from your body. <laughs> Sometimes I never heard of such a thing. Well, back when this little pamphlet was doing, they were just hearing about lasers. Guess what lasers do now? And they mastered it. Bzzz, you see a laser going in there? Not doing nothing here. You know what it's doing? Inside. We come up with that. We come up with that. We're humans. And you don't think God, you don't think God going in just, bzzz, they call God a liar every time, don't they? It's like, how can God hear you pray a long time ago? Now, my goodness, what I swore, and you never swear that you're yay, be yay, and you're nay, be nay. But, uh, you know, I never text. You know, I never text. I never do any of that stuff. Just want a stupid phone. Just be simple. My goodness, the stuff you can do with a phone now? I mean, and who's tracking you? Big Brother's got our whole, man, he's got everything on us. Whether we got diabetes, how tall we are, how big we are, where we go, where we eat, what we're used to. All those little things you go on on the internet and you think you're not going to get caught? They got all that down on you. I just get rid of the cookies. Man, they already ate them. I mean, what are you pleading, preacher? I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's all I'm going to do. I'm gonna, just like I agree with the devil, I agree with them. Comes to salvation, though, you ain't messing with me. I'm clean. Why? Because of him. But, I mean, we got all this stuff going on and we can't believe God can hear you pray. I mean, you go and you, like tonight, we'll, we'll, we'll have this little prayer before we go. You know, everybody, some, you know, if you're here and you think he's not hearing you, you're stupid. You're really stupid. There's something wrong with you. You're retarded. I mean, think about that. You're saved, got God inside of you, and he can't hear you? But we're in an age of skepticism because everybody thinks they're smarter than God. And they wouldn't even have knowledge if it wasn't from him. Allowing it to take place. And he, he preempted us by saying what? Knowledge puffeth up. So he told everybody in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, he just can't stand that pride because that's the devil, right? That's that spirit of the devil. You know, that bad pride I'm talking about where you lift yourself up above God. So he tells you, knowledge is coming, okay? And so as you're getting this knowledge, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get a big head. So he warns us. And we get a big head. And if you're saving, get a big head. He's got a big pin. He will, he will deflate it, man. He will really deflate it. And I'm telling you, you'll learn that over and over and over and over again. It's just one of them things. And um, <clears throat> so that the Word of God is powerful. I was thinking about how late they are, scientists there are, that is, to the Word of God. Remember, uh, evaporation, you go through all the scientific things in the Bible on, you know, evaporation, tides, and just a, a whole lot of things. How to, how to farm, how to cultivate by the moon, full moons. I mean, God's got it done. If you listen to Him, you can do it, you know. And I, I always use the illustration about the Confederate Army because I always see the movies where them doctors are cutting off amputees and, you know, everybody's getting infected. 
because they've got a bowl of water. Germs are staying in the water. Old Testament, you know what God told them to do? Use running water. What did he say to do with anything infection, like leprosy or anything? Burn it. That's why they lived through the plague, the black back plague, and they all thought they were witches. They were killing them because they thought they were witches because they were living. Well, they were just applying the Mosaic law, the cleansing. But back then, oh, no, if your family was dying, these suckers were walking around. You, you <laughs> Amen. Let his uh, blood be on us and our children. <clears throat> so Christ goes down and comes up. What happens? The Holy Spirit comes in. First thing he does is a spiritual operation. And there's an illustration here. He uses an ice tray. And I like it. The ice tray is sort of neat. When I draw, when I get the board up next week, because you'll have all this stuff, we'll just put it all together, shake it up, and I'll do a picture thing for you. But uh, you think about that ice tray. And I'm thinking about that now, and it's, it's, it's a good illustration. Anyway. And uh, it, it, it goes like, uh, you know how a nice tray is? Do you have them in your refrigerator? You know what? I don't even know if you have. Yeah, you can do it with the plastic ones, I guess. But the ice tray has, has cubes of ice in it. And how it started off was you put the water in the tray, right? And it's frozen. Now, if you go to take that out and just try to... Now they're, they're ruining the illustration because they got some neat ones now. But anyway, the old-time ones with the metal... If you try doing that, you're going to have ice everywhere, man. It just ain't, you know, we knew you were an amateur if you tried that. So what you did was you went and you used water, warm water, over the top. Then when you did that, they come out. And they come out exactly like that shape, right? Right? Well, you see, if you really understand what happened, you got an ice cube in the tray, but it's actually separated from that tray. It's real close, but it's separated. It's not connected anymore. Right? So when you got saved and the Holy Spirit got in there with that spiritual knife, He separated your soul from your body. So when the Old Testament talks about the soul that sinneth that shall die, what was it talking about? No spiritual circumcision. When the flesh sinned, the soul sinned. Stuck to it. And if you died in your sins, you go to hell. Old Testament. I mean, in Leviticus, you don't have to go there, but in Leviticus 22.11, uh, uh, the verse talks about uh, the soul which hath touched any such, such shall be unclean until even. And shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his flesh with water. What's it talking about? Some of the children of uh, Israel, you know, touched something unclean. It affected their soul. You have people go in there and do all these semantics with the Hebrew and everything. Say, well, you know, that soul can be, you know, it means, well, you better really look at this in Hebrew. You better really understand what he's talking about in Hebrew. That's all I can tell you. Because it'd be interesting. Because when you try to, when they try to do something like this and try to convince us that that's not, that's just talking about his body and not his soul, then it messes them up somewhere else in their little theology, and they don't want to answer those other things. No, you're either consistent or you're not consistent. It's the context. Oh yeah, because what people do is, and I hope we never do this, is you bring your experience of New Testament Christianity and you try to make it fit in the Old Testament. You think you're a hook-nosed Jew under the law. That's what you think you are. And you got some bennies as a, as a born-again believer. No, you're all messed up. You're, you're, you're on a different side of the cross, people. You're totally on a different side of the cross. If it talks about practical living, it's talking about things that you do. God says, don't do this, do that. Practical living, you, you, you best listen while you're in the flesh walking on planet Earth. But is my salvation? Mm-mm. <clears throat> you trusted Christ, what happened? Once again, Holy Spirit comes in, cuts my soul loose from my flesh. What happens next? Well, He regenerates my dead spirit, so that I have a new spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's what He said. Who said that? Jesus said that. Since the Holy Spirit is in me, 
and in the Lord, then I am in the Lord and he is in me. That's exactly what happened. Trust Christ comes into my body. My body is the temple of what? The Holy Ghost. Colossians there. You're in the Colossians, right? Chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Of course you're not. I didn't tell you to go there yet, but yeah, go there. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. I mean, I don't know. This is a tremendous verse to me. I'm not sure. You got Colossians chapter 2, right? Georgie, why don't you read that 9 and 10? I want to hear it. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the God head bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. What do you think that means? You're complete in him. Means that you're in them, right? <laughs> I mean, you couldn't be incomplete in the Lord. I mean, could you imagine that? Be like, be like the Lord walking around up there with a pimple. Ain't gonna happen. He's perfect, holy, no blemishes. And if you're in Him, you're the same way. Okay. How about Galatians two twenty? Maybe you'll eventually get this. Because I have a hard time with it still. But I know it teaches it. <coughs> the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth where? And the life that I now live, I live by the... By, by what? By the faith. That's a key word. Don't forget that word. It will really help you out in the line. <laughs> Faith of who? Huh? Mm -hmm. Amen. Does God call you a son of God? So we got a body, we got a soul, we got a spirit. Your spirit was dead to Christ, right? Dead to God. Yeah, it was. When Adam sinned, adios muchachos, that spirit got dead. Oh, yeah. And uh, everyone after Adam was born in Adam's likeness, according to that Bible. Uh, do we have some characteristics of God from the first Adam? Yeah, just shape, ears, eyes, you know, stuff like that. We know that because of Jesus. But that's about all you got. Nobody could be like the first Adam before the fall until you get born again. So here you are born again. As soon as you got saved, whether you know it or not, that's why there's a battle. That's why you have mind games in your head. That's why all the time you just, you just hate doing wrong, even though you do it. It's like there's laws in your members, warned against the law of your mind. God warned us in Romans. We still do it, though. We still do it because we're creatures of habit. It's hard. It's an enmity in there. Learn how to walk in the Spirit. It's supposed to be really easy. It's supposed to be like, okay, Lord, help me. And you do it one step at a time like a baby. You're a little bit like this, and you get stronger and stronger and stronger. But things come into our life and mess us up. <clears throat> the greatest hindrance is lack of character in your life before you got saved. Because creatures are habit. So if you had no character before that, my goodness, this guy got his work cut out for him, don't he? Sure he does. And that's why a lot of times when you have a church, if you have some kids that maybe be second, third generation, they're all proper and everything. Then you get the other ones coming in, and it's like, Where's the love? There's no love because somebody's now has taken that spirituality that they got and forgot that was because of two generations. That's what they got going. You see? And that's why a lot of churches, they'll go with the kids and teenagers to go wherever they got to go. Just get a little love and a respect or something, you know. And it's up to us not to, not to lower yourself to their level, but to love them like you're supposed to love them. And that is you're praying for them to get victory, to get over those things because it's going to be the best thing for them. Uh, going to university like this now, I'm seeing all the stuff, man, I should have learned. All the stuff. And if I'd have been more disciplined in my life back then, a oh, man. You know, they say, well, look at you now. Yeah, I know I'm not getting all that, that stuff. But, you know, God is, uh, there's a lot of rough areas because of that. And I can go to the book of Proverbs. And I can go through all those things in the book of Proverbs and see that, yep, 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 yep. God tells you what's going to happen. You're going to have a hard life. So our our... 
you know, when you, when you get this down with this body, soul, and spirit a little bit, you understand it's like, it's like that tire on your bike. Remember I drew a picture like that? Or a football, but it's like a tire on your bike. Right? The inner tube is your soul. It's the shape of the tire. Right? If you go down the road and there's no air in the inner tube, it's never a complete vacuum, so there's always a little air. It's like you're never, you're never lost. You got a little flicker. You know, Holy Spirit, you're never going to lose them. So you're going on this road with a flat tire. Boom, 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 boom. So what do you do? You got to put air in that tube. You get full of that air. That tire goes down the road a whole lot better. You get full of the Holy Spirit. You walk better. You talk better. You do things right. And then what's really cool when you think about it, your soul never touches the dirty road. Only your body. Tires, the only thing hits that road. So that would get you out of a whole lot of stuff. You need to think about that for a little bit. You're going to tell me your soul's doing the sinning? Hmm. If the rich man's soul went to hell, where's your soul going? Hmm. You'll never see Abraham afar off. Why? Because heaven's not in the middle of the earth anymore. That's nothing before the cross. Abraham's bosom went up with the Lord when he took captivity captive. This stuff is like meat stuff. It's like a stew. You get what you can get, why you can get it, and then beat your head up a little bit and, and, and don't worry about it for a while. Next year, you know, I guarantee it. It'll hit. Because somehow you got to figure out during camp meeting or something or a good preacher, when you're sitting there, and you're looking around, everybody's crying. We don't know what's going on. You tell me what's happening. It ain't like you're just making this up and you're emotional. Some of you ladies probably are, but I mean, it's like, I, you know, I wait, man. I don't just jump up and like they try to pepper alley me and junk. I mean, I heard all of them things. I, you know, I'll say amen, glory to God. You know, I know I'm supposed to praise them. I'll thank them for it. But I know when something comes in here because I got it here. See, my spirit was quickened. And that's why when the Holy Spirit comes in, that's that like spirit when he manifests himself. And that's why you, you're suspicious sometimes when other people don't have nothing. There's nothing. There's just nothing. So sometimes it could be because they're a little bit messed up up here, right? Sometimes they're really too deep and they're trying to figure everything out. Sometimes they're embarrassed because they're not used to that. They don't know how to explain it. I just enjoy it. Listen, I did a whole lot of drugs to get, get to that place, to mess my mind up, to have me figure out I can just sit and have the Holy Ghost fill me and me feel like I'm like that for free. And it don't hurt me. I mean, so they're not taking that away from me. I know it's emotionalism and I know it's all this. I got too many scriptures to back that up. If they want to sit around like that, they can sit around. But when God comes in, I'm excited about it. If he can get a hold of my heart as hard as I am and squeeze that and make me have at it, buddy. Glory to God. What does that tell you? I know it's him. <laughs> He's alive. He's here. Amen. So this is good study. See, this is good stuff because you're, you're already in heaven, basically. But yet you're down here. You're in him. He's in you. John 17. You need to go home and read that over and over again a whole lot of times figure out what's going on. Because there's a whole lot of things I've, I, I just can't understand. It's like just figuring out why he'd love me. I stop. After I understand how holy he is and what I have saw him do and how I saw the flood come on and I saw all them people die and here he 
died for me. And I'm saved. And for some strange reason, he made me to sit in heavenly places. He just made me do it. And you know he said he made just so when the devil rocks you, you say, uh-uh, he made me. He made me to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there, he put me there. He sealed me. He saved me. He's going to glorify me. Do I understand all that? Mm-mm. Do I understand the Trinity? For? Mm-mm. What do you do, preach? Why are you, why are you teaching this? I just believe it. I just believe what it says. I can't handle all this. You crack your brain. You go in the nut house. You gotta have you gotta you gotta have his body off to understand this fully. You gotta have your new body, man. It, it's got that capacity. There ain't no way, man, we can handle all this at once. Just a little glimpse every now and then, a little excitement, that's whew. could you, if you really thought about it, you know. I've been on some trips before. But like three or four days of solid, solid God, what would you do? You'd have a heart attack and die. You really would. I have driven home at, at night from camp meetings and didn't turn my lights on. I thought they was on. And there's times when I worked midnights, and when I went in midnights, I felt like Moses, I wanted to cover my head because I didn't want nobody to see the glory, man. Really, it was some weird stuff, man. God does that. He gets in you, man. He fills you. It's all about him, man. You go thinking about that flesh, that outside person, and what it's come in contact with and all that stuff, and you keep thinking about that and dwelling on that, dwelling on that, or what you did in it and all that stuff, you forget you've been spiritually circumcised. My chains fell off. So what you're doing is just a habit, a bad habit. That means you have to change your behavior traits. It's an exchange, right? Your old life with his. And so you you just like this. The old music with his kind of music. It's just everything's an exchange. You don't have to do it. Because Ephesians, we didn't get to that verse yet, but it talks about waking up. Thou that sleepest. And he's talking to Christians. That means they're sleeping in the flesh and they like it. He's saying, wake up.